Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for choosing to join us this morning in worship. We are very excited that you're here with us at the Church of South Lake Online. We're continuing our series called Unstoppable as we look at the rise of the church in the book of Acts and what the Holy Spirit was doing with these early believers as they literally changed the world. Last week, Pastor Brian introed this series, and he made the comment that the book in, of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles, but another title that could be given to it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because as we look at this book and what is happening around the world through these believers, it's all being propelled by the power of the Holy Spirit working in them. When Jesus left his disciples after his resurrection, during his ascension, he told them to go into Jerusalem and wait because he said this event was going to happen in which his spirit, the Holy Spirit, was going to come on them and give them power and enable them to go out into the world and to be his witnesses. And so we're continuing this week and we're looking at some of the characteristics that the Holy Spirit empowers believers in the church so they're able to fulfill the command to be witnesses of the kingdom of God. Now, as we read through these chapters, most of us would probably agree that the apostles and the believers in these chapters, they're incredible men and women. Um, it's hard to, to acknowledge the fact that they're just regular human beings, that God is doing amazing things through regular human beings just like you and me. We look at some of the things that they do, Peter and Paul, Philip, uh, John, and we, we think that these are almost like superhuman in nature. And if you're anything like me, I read these, these chapters and I go through my life and I have this incredible desire for significance. Not only in my faith, just in every avenue, but especially in my faith. I look at the world and I think, dear Lord, it would be awesome if you would use me in a way that just completely changes this world. That I would leave a mark, that people would be better off from me, that culture would be changed, that people would have hope. And that's such a strong desire. And I don't think that's a bad desire for us to want to be like the individuals in this book, impacting the world for good, sharing the message of Jesus. I think the danger comes when we get it out of order. You see, a few years ago, God convicted me through some quiet times over the span of a few months that my desire for significance was overpowering my desire for obedience. You see, I, I wanted to be obedient, but more than that, I wanted to be useful for the kingdom of God. And that trumped my desire to be obedient to what God was doing. And I think that when we get those two out of line, everything falls apart. And you see, our theme for this whole series is this. We're witnessing the Holy Spirit empowering the people of God to be witnesses of the kingdom of God. These early believers, they're going through the world, they're sharing a message that has not been shared in many places, that God was coming to establish his kingdom here. And you and I, believers in the 21st century, we have the same message. We get to go to people who may have heard about the Bible, they may know a little bit about church, but they don't know Jesus, they don't know the power of the kingdom. And we get to come to them, and through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, show them what the kingdom of God is like. And so today, I, I want to dive into our first um, characteristic that we see the Holy Spirit empower the believers with. And honestly, I believe that this characteristic is foundational to everything else we're talking about in this series, and that is the foundation of obedience. And if you're anything like me, that is not the word you want to hear. At this point, you're probably like, all right, mm, don't want to listen to that today. Let's see what another church is talking about on here. But obedience is so important because it draws us alongside what God is doing. It's hard for us to be useful, to have significance, to really dive into God's story if we're not coming alongside and saying, God, however you want to do it is how I want to do it. And to accomplish this, we're going to look at a story of a man named Philip in the book of Acts. We're going to be starting right in Acts chapter 8. Now, Philip was not a special individual. He, he was not one of the apostles. He did not walk alongside Jesus. Philip was a regular man. He loved Jesus. He knew some of the teachings from the apostles. But what happened was in Acts chapter 6, as the church was growing in Jerusalem, the work that the apostles had to accomplish was so great that they decided to take on seven individuals to uh, basically become deacons in the first church. Their job was to go and be the hands and feet of the church, interacting with those who had needs and ministering to them. So Philip was not some kind of crazy high up guy in the early church. He was just a servant. But we're going to look at, at Philip and what he did in the midst of the Holy Spirit guiding him. And we start off in Acts chapter 8. And what we see is this obedience. The first point I want to get is this obedience is not dictated by circumstance. And that is honestly one of the hardest things to grasp about obedience because let's be honest, there are times when it's much easier to obey and times when obedience is not exactly the first thing on our mind. And as we look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1, what we're seeing is this. There's been a period of about three years from Jesus' ascension to this time when the apostles um, are in Jerusalem right now. And this is what we see happen. 
Chapter 8, verse 1 reads, And Paul approved of his execution. Now, the his is talking about is Stephen. In the chapters preceding this, one of the other deacons to the early church, Stephen, was stoned publicly for his faith. And we have this individual, Saul, who is a Pharisee, and he's, he's going to become the apostle Paul later, but this is before his conversion. It says, Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so what we have going on here at the start of Philip's story is the church is not in a very safe and happy spot. The church undergoes immense persecution in Jerusalem to the point that the believers flee the city. Now, this has been their base of operations for years. When Jesus left, he told them they would be his witnesses to the entire world. But up until now, it's been Jerusalem. And so this persecution arises. The church is not really in a safe position. And so everyone except the apostles flees from Jerusalem, Philip being one of them. He leaves, he runs out here. And what happens next is in verse 4, this is what we see Philip and the other individuals, the other believers of the other church doing. It says, now those who were scattered in this persecution went about preaching the word. Now, we would read this passage, and it's tempting to look at this and see in the persecution that's happening, what should their priority be? Probably to get out, get their families out, get established some will, start building some kind of community, getting their feet underneath them. But what we actually see happen is the first thing the believers do in the midst of this persecution is they go out and they proclaim the gospel even more. The thing that had gotten them kicked out of Jerusalem was the very thing that they did more so after they were kicked out of Jerusalem. Their obedience was not dictated by the circumstance of how their home life was at Jerusalem. The persecution they were facing, they're wandering through the entire Judean wilderness. No, they were obedient regardless of that. You see, the gospel has always thrived in persecution. There are countless stories in this book. There are countless stories around the world from missionaries and countries where the gospel and the church faces severe persecution. And in the midst of that, God uses this persecution to further mission. And we see that happen here. The persecution that rose up in Jerusalem, God used that, what man and the world meant for evil, God used for good to spread his church throughout the entire world. Right now, around the world, there are countries all over where, where churches are meeting. Um, a lot of them, they, don't, they aren't able to meet in, in kind of a communal aspect. They meet in small house churches. Some of them get to meet in larger groups. But all over, churches are meeting. In some countries, the church is flourishing. It's growing exponentially. In other countries, the church is almost stagnant. And so I want you to think for a minute. Where do you think that the church population is growing the fastest in the world? On every nation you can think of, based on their demographics, their religious beliefs, where they're located geographically, where do you think the church is growing the fastest? I bet you it's not where you think it is. The fastest growing population of the church is actually in Iran nowadays. Crazy. According to Operation World, who goes about gathering statistics for the church around the world and compiling prayer requests for these different nations, the country of Iran over the year of 2019 grew at a rate of 19.6%. That means the church in Iran was growing at 20% every year. Number uh, 18 on that list was North Korea. I mean, we're looking at countries where if you're a Christian and it's found out, like, that's it, game over, story's done. And the church is flourishing. Number one's Iran, number two's Afghanistan. Both of them, their percentage of growth is double the third church. They're both up about 20% of growth. Now, to put it in comparison, the United States where we're at, where we may not always want to hear about Christianity, but Christianity is pretty well accepted, the church is growing at 0.8%. We actually rate 30th on the countries that are growing the slowest. And so you contrast those. You see that people in Iran where you're heavily persecuted. I mean, Iran has a population about 96% that is Shi'i Muslim. And if you think that Islam and Christianity can exist side by side, that's not even close to being true. You read the Quran, you read the Bible, they are diametrically opposed, completely different in what they're teaching. They don't just sit peacefully side by side. And so you have this country that is predominantly Muslim, and I'm not saying that all Muslims are against Christians, but I'm saying at the core of their faith, they don't coexist peacefully. And you have a Christian population there that is growing exponentially every year. And yes, I know we can look at and say, well, foster the populations of the United States and Iran, they're different. Yes, The United States has 1,000 times the number of evangelical Christians compared to Iran. So Iran ranks 1,000th of our Christian population, yet their church is growing at 1,4th of what ours is growing. So even though we have more people, they have less people, they're still growing much faster than our church is. And what we're seeing here is that even in the midst of persecution, in the midst of dire circumstances, unwelcome times, the church flourishes. 
And that's exactly what we see in this book right here. Philip and the other disciples, the apostles who are staying in Jerusalem, still witnessing, but the other believers are going throughout the Judean wilderness and they're proclaiming the gospel and rather than getting squashed in persecution, it flourishes. And what I, what I think we need to take away from this is we don't need to look for the right circumstance to be obedient. I think it's more important we just obey. Now, yes, I believe the Holy Spirit can guide and direct us to specific ways to be obedient. I believe the Holy Spirit can caution us, hey, hold back right now. Wait till the opportune time. But if you're like me, years ago, I used to wrestle with this a lot. And I'll be honest, I still do a little bit today. I would kind of wait for the opportune time from the Holy Spirit. And what's neat is Jesus actually tells us what the opportune time is. In the beginning of the book of Acts, this is what he tells his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The opportune time to be a witness was when the Holy Spirit came. If you're a believer nowadays, the Holy Spirit's here. There is no more waiting for an opportune time. This is it. We're right in the middle of the most opportune time ever. And I think God just expects us to obey. If the opportunity is great, the circumstance is great, that's awesome. If the circumstance is not so great, that's okay. The church flourishes. We see growth. Now, as we watch Philip, he's not just preaching in light of persecution. That in itself is an amazing feat. But look at where he's preaching. In verse 5 of chapter 8, this is what we see. Philip leaves Jerusalem, and it says this, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, if we just read through that passage, it doesn't really stick out to us. It's like, okay, he's in some city, he's in Samaria. There's something about Jerusalem and Samaria. What's happening is this. The Samaritans and the Jews were about as polar opposites as you could be. The Jews did not associate with Samaritans, so much so that when they were traveling, if they were coming from outside to Jerusalem, Jews would actually circle the entire country of Samaria because they did not want to go through any kind of Samaritan city. They could not stand the Samaritans. And that goes back way, way far in their history when conflicts arose between the two, but they would not talk to, they did not associate with Samaritans. Back in Jesus' ministry, he's, he's sitting with a Samaritan woman at the well, and his disciples are kind of amazed, not just that he's talking to a woman, but a Samaritan woman at that. Like, this is a huge faux pas. You don't do that, Jesus. And where's the first place that Philip goes? To a city in Samaria. To a city of the people that he probably can't stand. To a city where the people probably did not want to see him. Now, in our lives, here's the thing. Our obedience nowadays, much like Philip, is not dictated by comfort either. It's easy and it's comfortable for me to go and seek out people that have similar beliefs, that have similar ideals. We see the same kind of paradigm in life. We like the same things. We disagree on similar things. It's very easy for me to be comfortable in that environment and to share my faith with them. It is much harder for me to go to people that I am not comfortable with, either because I completely disagree with things about you and your lifestyle and your belief system, or we have had a huge falling out. It's awkward to be together. There's anger in that situation. But what we're seeing is God does not give us as a church a pass just because it's not comfortable. Philip goes down to Samaria where there is this great divide culturally. And what does he do? He starts proclaiming to them the Christ. And what we see over the course of the rest of this chapter is that Philip's ministry in Samaria actually flourishes. People are coming to know Christ. They're becoming believers left and right, so much so that they message back to Jerusalem and Peter and John come down just to help. I mean, Philip, just a regular guy in the church, his ministry is going so well, he has to get the big guys in Jerusalem to come down and help him because it's too much. And so they come down and they do the same thing. They're ministering to these people that before this, they did not get along at all. And I want us to understand in this passage, it doesn't indicate that the Jews and the Samaritans got together, that suddenly the comfort was there. It doesn't say that. Maybe it did as they became believers, as they understood Christ. Maybe that was the unifying feature. But what we're seeing is these Jewish believers go down to the place where they are not welcome to the people that they do not agree with, and they start sharing the gospel with them. And this is a beautiful thing. Now, for you and I, it it may not be a racial difference, a cultural difference that's separating us in comfort. It could be a political difference. It could be an educational difference. It could be a lifestyle difference. And what's important in this is we don't see Philip necessarily going down and affirming everything that the Samaritans believed. He's not affirming their lifestyles. He's not affirming every little thing about them. But what he is doing is he's intentionally going to where he is not welcome, to where he is not feeling comfortable at, and he's sharing the gospel there. And so as we look around, life is crazy right now. 
Uh, believe me, I wish we were all in this building every single week. I miss it. I miss seeing my friends. I miss getting to worship together with other believers. But in the midst of how crazy this is, God has still allowed me to interact and to cross paths with other stories almost daily. Some of those are friends, people I know very well. Some of them people I've never met. Some of them are people that I don't always get along easiest with. And just because that comfort is not there, God does not give me a pass on being obedient to witnessing to them, to loving them, to sharing the gospel with them. And I'll be honest, I'm not teaching you this like, hey, you need to do like me and and do this. Like, I wrestle with this every day. I wish I could tell you it was so easy for me to go to people that I don't get along with and tell them about Jesus. No, it is a complete wrestle of the heart in those moments. My heart cries out and says, I don't want to share the gospel with them, Jesus. You know what they do. You know what they've done to me. You know what they've said about your name. I don't want to do this. And Jesus very graciously reminds me, well, Foster, I got on a cross for you when you didn't know me, when you didn't love me, when you didn't like me, when you disagreed with me. And that convicts me hardcore. And I believe he's calling us to do the same thing, to go to the people that don't listen, that don't want us, that we don't get along with. And as we look at that, so we've seen that obedience is not dictated by circumstance. It's not dictated by our comfort. We see that obedience is also not dictated by our understanding. So Philip is in Samaria, okay? This ministry is exploding. It's thriving. People are coming to know Christ. Hillsong is being formed in the early days, and they are having a great time worshiping the apostles there. And what happens is this. In verse 26, this is what happens to Philip. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then this is what it says. This is a desert place. And so we see Philip is in these cities in Samaria going around proclaiming the message of the kingdom of God, proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. People are responding. He's witnessing and he's seeing individuals on that spot come to know Christ. They're being baptized in water. They're being baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's this change. And what happens in the midst of this thriving, the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go to this desert road out in the middle of nowhere. And the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, it was a 49-mile stretch of desert. (laughs) <laughs> there's nothing there. It's a desert road. It's in the middle of nowhere. You have to imagine, Philip's mind has got to be going, wait, what? Lord, I, I, get, I get you're sovereign, you know these things, but do you not see what's going on right here? Do you not see the blessings that you've given me with my neighbors, with my friends, with my coworkers? Do you not see what's happening as I'm sharing the gospel? I'm being obedient to you, God. Why would you want me to go to the middle of nowhere? But actually what we've seen in this passage, Philip doesn't question it. The angel Lord says, go to the desert road. And Philip gets up and he goes. He follows the spirit to the desert place. He left a flourishing ministry to go to a dying desert. And see, here's the thing. Sometimes God calls us to the desert intentionally. Now, if you've ever been through any kind of desert, a spiritual desert, an emotional desert, a relational desert, they're not fun. They're downright miserable. A few years ago, I went through a spiritual desert for about two years. No matter how much I was in the word, how much I was in fellowship, I, God just felt quiet. He didn't feel gone. I didn't feel like I was lost, but I was like, God, I'm crying out to you. Why won't you speak to me? But here's the thing. I, I came to find, by his grace, because I'm incredibly stubborn, I came to find that the desert's actually a very beautiful place. Because when we get out to the desert, all the distractions are gone. There's literally nothing in the desert. There's not trees Okay? There's no buildings. Very rarely are there people. There's none of that. It's just you and expanse, dust, as far as you can see. And so Philip follows the Spirit's leading. He goes to this desert place, and what happens? He meets this individual from Ethiopia, a eunuch of Ethiopia. He was a court official of Candace, who was the queen of Ethiopia. And as he's going along, this Ethiopian eunuch is riding along and Philip follows the spirit's leading. He says, go up to the chariot. So Philip's kind of walking beside the chariot while it's going on this desert road. This one individual out in the middle of nowhere. And the Ethiopian eunuch is reading this passage from Isaiah. And, and Philip cries out to him, goes, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch goes, well, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And so he invites Philip up into the chariot. Philip gets there and he, he reads this passage from Isaiah. It says, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch looks at Philip and says, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And scripture says that beginning with that passage, 
that one passage from the scroll of Isaiah, Philip goes and expounds on the entire gospel message of Jesus Christ. And the story goes that the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, there's a puddle of water on the side of the road. There's a desert. There's not much water. Can I be baptized in that puddle? Philip's like, yeah, sure. So they pull over. He gets the eunuch out. They walk down the water. He baptizes him. And because his obedience to follow the spirit to the middle of the desert, leaving behind what seemed great and glorious for God to go to the middle of nowhere, he witnesses to and baptizes this one individual. Now, what's interesting is this. Jesus tells his disciples, you'll be my witnesses to Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In their day, the country of Ethiopia was considered the southernmost ends of the earth geographically. There wasn't considered to be much civilization beyond that. Because of Philip's faithfulness to go to the desert, he witnesses to this Ethiopian eunuch who then takes the gospel message to the end of the earth as they knew it. Because he was obedient, not because he understood. You know, being obedient is not always easy. Isaiah 55, 9, this beautiful passage when we listen to God, this is really what we need to take to heart. It says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It is so easy and tempting for us to look at what the Holy Spirit calls us to, where he's leading us, what God desires, and say, God, I don't get it, or God, I don't understand, or God, I don't like that. And that's fair. I Nowhere in Scripture do I see God commanding me, Foster, you have to like what I'm saying. No. What does he say? Foster, I want you to do what I'm saying. I want you to believe me, to trust me. You may not like it. You may not understand it. My ways as the sovereign God of all creation are much higher than your 28 years of life understanding by just a lot of it. And when we get that, that God's ways are higher, that he works in ways we don't understand, that he is always aware of what is to come, I think that gives us hope that if we follow him, even when we don't understand, even when it's not easy, maybe God knows what he's doing. God knew that Ethiopian unit was going to be there that day on that specific stretch of 49 miles of desert road. He knew exactly what time Philip needed to get there. And he said, Philip, go. Philip had no idea. Philip was probably thinking, I'm going to wander for 50 miles in the desert. Maybe he had more faith than me and said, I'm going to go there and God, you're going to do something. I don't know that I would have been that faithful, hopefully. But Philip goes and we see this amazing witness take place. And so we've looked at a lot of the negatives of obedience. Obedience is not dictated by circumstance. It's not dictated by comfort. And it is not dictated by understanding. But I want to look at this last positive. You see, obedience is active. I think it's tempting as believers sometimes to, to read our Bibles, to look at what Scripture is saying, and to affirm in our hearts, okay, God, I agree with you. Adultery, that's bad. Yes, 100%. Yes, Lord, love the needy. I get it. We need to be witnesses, light, salt. I got you. Yes, Lord, idolatry is bad. I'm, I'm not going to love anything before you. And it stops. My heart is crying out to worship God. My lifestyle, well, it's a little hectic right now, but I'm not, I'm not as bad as them. I'm not murdering. I'm not, I'm not being unfaithful. I'm not, I'm not robbing people blind. But what we see here in, is that it doesn't stop with the heart. Obedience is a call to action. When the Holy Spirit was leading Philip and the other believers, he wasn't saying, hey, Philip, I want you to understand I'm the Spirit of God. What I'm saying is good. I just need you to believe that what I'm saying is good and right. Philip's like, yeah, absolutely. No, the Holy Spirit said, Philip, I'm the Spirit of God, and I am right, and I want you to go do something. You're not going to understand it. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be under the most ideal of circumstances. But Philip, I want you to go. And we see Philip get out, and his obedience becomes action. You see, in the book of James, James is writing this, this letter to the church, and he encourages them this, in this, and this is a very famous passage in chapter 1, verse 22. James writes this, he says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You see, when we, when we listen to a sermon, when we read this book and we put it down, and maybe we have a great devotional over a cup of coffee, and maybe we journal about it real quick, and then we get up and that's it. We go about our day and we're kind of like, Lord, help me to have a positive outlook. Help me to, to be a good influence. And it stays there. We're actually going against what Scripture commands us. Scripture doesn't say, take in the word, let it sit there and be good, and that's okay, you're obedient. No, Scripture says, take what you're learning and actively live out this witness, proclaiming the kingdom of God wherever you are. 
And this is not an easy message, guys. I wish I could tell you my spiritual gift was evangelism. Um, I struggle like nobody's business evangelizing. I'm so jealous of people I see that have that gift and they can go and talk to anybody. It's so smooth and so fluid. They're sharing the witness of the kingdom of God. And I go up there and I'm like, uh, my, my name's Foster. They're like, this guy's so weird. But just because I struggle with it, I'll be honest, I don't get a pass from it. James doesn't say be doers of the word, not hearers only, unless you're just not good at it. No. He says, go and do it. Live out that obedience. Now, living obedience is not easy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not reading these passages and saying, hey, because you're a believer, because God has saved you, because the Holy Spirit's in you, you have no excuse. I mean, you kind of have no excuse, but what we're really getting at is this. See, the Holy Spirit is the one who's moving us. The Holy Spirit is the one who's empowering us. I love doing good, but I'll be honest with you guys. I love doing evil far more. And you may be watching this and like, whoa, Foster, I don't know if I want to listen to this. Cover the kids' ears. This is heretical. I identify 100% with Paul. Listen to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. He says, I find it a law in Romans 7, 21. I find it a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I'll be honest, I, I want to be obedient. I so desperately want to be obedient. And I wrestle with the, the conflict of obedience and significance because there are days I want to be significant more than I want to be obedient. And I, I fully believe that significance for the kingdom cannot trump obedience to the God of that kingdom. And I get moments where I'm able to be obedient, but the desire to grasp for significance at the cost of obedience or before obedience is so tempting, so alluring, so desirable. My inner spirit cries out, God, you know I want to do good. Why am I so terrible? Why do I struggle with it? And this is my encouragement. If that's you, you're like, Foster, I want to do well. I want to be obedient to God. I want to live out the gospel. I want to be a witness of the kingdom of God everywhere that I go. But Foster, I struggle. I feel you. Working for a church, going to a Bible school, being up here, teaching the word, handling the word does not make me any better at living out the kingdom of God than you nor does it make me any, any more adept at it, nor does it make it come even easier to me. Here is the ultimate deciding factor, and this is what I want to leave you with today. As we're looking at the church, okay, we're looking at the Holy Spirit empowering and moving through believers, this is what we see about believers then with Philip and nowadays with you and me. You see, the Holy Spirit empowers the church to be obedient in their pursuit of God. Yes, we do have to pursue obedience, you and I. We have to make an effort. We can't just sit on the couch and, well, Holy Spirit, make me obedient. That's not how it works. We have to go and pursue it. We will never be enough to do it on our own. And the Holy Spirit is the one who comes in and empowers us and enables us to pursue that obedience. To pursue it before anything else. I hope I'm significant for the gospel. I hope I give people hope. I hope that the culture is at least rubbed the wrong way when it encounters me. I hope that the world is even just a slight bit different when I pass. But more than that, I hope that when I wake up and stand before God, he'll say, good job. You did your best to be as obedient as you could. Yeah, you skinned your knees. Yeah, you messed up at times. But you genuinely tried to be obedient. My quiet time months ago was what spurred this on. I was reading through the book of Matthew and Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's there at his final hours and he's crying out, sweating blood and he says, Father, let this cup pass but not by my will, by yours. And as I was reading that passage, I was like, there it is, clear as day. I want to be significant like Jesus. I want to give people hope but Jesus' concern, his primary concern was submitting to the Father, being obedient and glorifying the Father. He cried out and said, I, I, I know what the crucifixion is. I would rather not go through that, but Lord, let's do your will. If your will is this, I will be obedient and I will walk to that cross to glorify you. For you and I, I think that God is calling us and empowering us to be obedient where we're at. Circumstance, this is a terrible circumstance right now. This year has been awful. Let's just be honest. Terrible circumstance, perfect moment to witness. Comfort, man, there are a lot of people that we don't see eye to eye with. Every single one of us perfect opportunity for witness. Understanding, if I've learned anything in the past few years, it's I don't understand anything about God. Perfect opportunity to witness. Guys, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful to be part of our church and our community, to be diving in and loving our community for the gospel. 
to be representing God, to be proclaiming the kingdom of God and be witnesses right now, especially with everything that's going on with COVID. Thank you for all that you guys do. We are so excited to continue doing ministry with you, even if it's virtually like this. Um, Some of you guys joined us on our virtual group last week, and if you're watching this, and you're feeling like God is leading you, like, I need to do more. There's something the Holy Spirit's pushing me to do. Maybe it's to get connected in fellowship and to dive into study time in the scriptures. And we have a way that you can do that with our virtual group. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to churchatsouthlake.com slash virtual group. We had a great turnout for our last one, and we'd love to have more of you in there and getting the chance to really dive in and, and engaging this passage with other believers. We're so excited to do that. On the screen in front of you, you're going to see a link for prayer. And if if something's come up during this message, if there's anything been on your heart this week, we would love to know so that we can be in prayer for you. All you need to do is just click that link and we can can see exactly what you're saying. You send it to us. It just goes to us. It's not being broadcast on Facebook or anything like that. But it lets us know how we can be a part of your story and a part of how God is using you. And guys, thank you so much for, for tuning in again. As we wrap up right now, I just want to take a moment and pray for you, pray for your families, and pray for this coming week. If you go ahead and bow your heads with me. Father, thank you so much for how gracious you are. Lord, I thank you for the chance to be part of this this community, this church body, this group of believers. Lord, you know that I am not the most qualified for this, but in your grace, you've allowed me to be here, and I'm so excited to learn and to grow and to serve beside my brothers and sisters. I'm thankful, Lord, that when I am not obedient, that when I don't represent you well and I don't fall in the footsteps of Philip, that you are gracious to me, Lord, that you bring me back, that yes, you correct me when I need it, but you are so gracious to bring me back to your story and to give me another chance to be obedient. God, I pray if there's anybody listening today that they're wrestling with this, that you would encourage them. If they feel like they've truly messed up, they've missed the opportunity to be obedient, to be obedient, I pray that you'd be gracious and provide them more opportunities to help them see how you're constantly bringing moments to be obedient into their lives. And Lord, for all of us, I pray that our greatest desire would be to be obedient to you and to glorify you. That the desire for significance and usefulness and purpose would not trump that any moment of the day, but that from our obedience, we would become useful to you. That we would be significant in your story. That you would use us to glorify yourself and to further your kingdom. Lord, if there's anybody in our church that's hurting right now that is just really going through a difficult time, I pray that you'd bring comfort and healing. If they feel isolated and alone, I pray that you'd raise some of us up to come around them so that they do not feel like they are cast off to the side in the middle of the desert, absolutely isolated from the world. Lord, I love you so much. I trust you. I thank you for how good you are. I, I pray that you'd help me to be more obedient this coming week. And I pray all these things in your name. Amen.